how many of us can function with a straight mind if we don't have a cup of coffee in the morning. I know that I do think that caffeine is probably the most efficacious over-the-counter supplements on the market in the world. It's such a double-edged sword. Welcome everybody to a new episode of Agi Life with Astrid, your APD. Um, today we're talking all things supplements with William Wallace. What is your, a little bit of your background and why do you do what you do? So I have a PhD in, in health and human performance where my primary areas of study are in nutrition, more on the, the supplemental side of nutrition, and then also neuroscience kind of incorporated that into my tool set because it's a unique area that I find particularly uh, interesting myself. Uh, I had initially entered the health and fitness space back in 2015 when I started my master's degree at the University of Tampa. And, and there I was involved in research that largely dealt with dietary supplements geared towards sports nutrition, because that's where we were getting our grants from. And in 2018, I moved down to Fort Lauderdale to work with a company called Life Extension, uh, more so in industry, whereas previously I was in research. And Life Extension sits more inside the, the longevity and health sector. So I had kind of left the sports and fitness world, but I was still involved with their clinical research lab as well. So I was getting the, the best of both worlds in industry and, and in research. Early last year, I was finishing my doctorate. Well, first I moved over to a company called Revive, who I still have a great relationship with, and I love those guys. They're in Stewart, Florida. I was offered a, a partnership in a company in Ohio where it is called, the company is called Muscle Feast, and so they sit more inside sports nutrition. They do and own their own manufacturing, which is very unique for a supplement company to, to do is their own manufacturing. But with that, they were also <laughs> building out a research facility and starting a, a nonprofit through which that research was going to run yeah, of which I, I'm a founder of that. And so we just finished our first clinical trial. Uh, that's kind of the trajectory of my career. I kind of have one foot in research at all times and also one foot inside uh, the industry, whereas in industry, product development and quality control have largely been my areas of, of expertise, if you will. That's awesome. And I guess that is something we need to talk about now is looking at supplements. And obviously there are <laughs> overrated supplements in the fitness industry. And we hear a lot about magical effects that this will have in your health or your performance, your recovery, uh, so on and so forth. Let's go through some of those supplements that probably you hear quite often. Are they overrated? Are they underrated? And maybe give me some rationale of why you think they are overrated or underrated. So the first one is magnesium. So do you think magnesium is overrated or underrated? I don't think that one is really over or underrated. I think that that one is pretty legitimate insofar as the, the claims, most claims that are made about it. Of course, you're always going to have people that step outside the boundaries with uh, marketing claims on things like that. But magnesium is one of those things where, I mean, it's so important to fundamental health in so many ways. By itself, it's involved or implicated in over 600 different metabolic reactions. Every metabolic reaction that implicates ATP uses magnesium. Because of that, I do not believe that it's an overrated supplement. I have a short list of supplements where I say that generally speaking, uh, regardless of the condition or, or what else you're doing, if you have a condition, always speak to your, your doctor, but I have a short list of supplements where I say, generally speaking, you can take this supplement, it would likely benefit you. And if not benefit you, at least wouldn't harm you. But magnesium is, is on that short list where I do believe most people should be taking some form of supplemental magnesium. All right. When it comes to magnesium, there are a few types of magnesium and depending on the type, it will have a more specific benefit into specific areas. For example, magnesium glycinate will have an effect on sleep. So I'm totally different to other type of magnesium. Do you want to perhaps run through the type of magnesium and what are the benefits of each? Sure. Magnesium does what magnesium does, and that's a lot of different things. But depending on the salt or you know amino acid that it's paired with, that will affect tissue distribution, which might impact the outcomes as far as supplementation goes. If we look at the forms, I would say one of the more poor forms of magnesium, and that would be oxide because it's so poorly bioavailable. And most magnesium oxide doesn't make it past the gut. And that's why magnesium, or one reason why magnesium oxide is, is such a good laxative. If you actually go into the laxative section of a pharmacy, then you can get like a liquid vial of magnesium oxide. And if you're ever backed up, then that, that should do the trick. You can climb up the ladder a bit and then you have magnesium citrate, which most people say magnesium citrate, uh, at least I've, I've heard a lot of, of people saying that magnesium citrate is not a good form, which is not entirely true. I think its bioavailability is somewhere between 46 and 60%, which really is not that bad. Preferentially, it distributes itself into muscle tissue. And so I think that magnesium citrate is an adequate form of magnesium, especially if you're already sitting with inadequacy status. I think that's something important for people to understand is that most forms of magnesium are good for maintaining adequacy status. 
but it's not obvious that all forms of magnesium are equal when it comes to reaching adequacy status if you sit outside of that. And on top of that, you have magnesium glycinate, which as you said, has a sleep effect because more easily makes its way to the brain than citrate, but it also accumulates proportionally more in scalable muscle, at least in comparison to some of these other forms of magnesium that I'm about to mention, and that would be magnesium torate or magnesium acetyl torate. Pretty close to the difference of being an acetyl group between the two of them, but magnesium torate, acetyl torate, and three and eight are most likely to make their way into and concentrate in the brain. You don't have to worry so much about taking different forms to making sure that your body is getting it all, all over the place. You can pick one form and as long as you're getting enough elemental magnesium. Because the RDA is 400 milligrams for an adult. I think that, that that itself is good enough. Now, I'm fortunate enough to, to work in this industry and so I'm exposed to a lot of different materials at costs that, that are much cheaper than other people are. So yeah, I myself will take magnesium glycinate uh, as well as magnesium torate every night in, in hopes you know, that I'm getting some into my brain and, and distributing it evenly. But is, is that the case? I, I don't really know. I just one of those, maybe one of those things that, that we all do. But that's kind of, that's an overview of the better forms of magnesium, whereas I also mentioned, I'm going to say one of the, the worst forms. And then also you have magnesium malate, which is, is also, uh, I would put that just under magnesium glycinate, where it's just above magnesium citrate in the totem pole. Got it. Now let's move to our next supplement. Probably this one is quite popular, creatine. Is creatine overrated, underrated, properly rated? What is your verdict? <laughs> I think that it's properly rated when you're talking about it in the context of sports nutrition, but it's underrated when talking about it in the context of other health outcomes. Everybody that's within the fitness sector knows that creatine is one of the most studied and verified ingredients for promoting a sports performance, strength, muscle growth, but not a lot of people talk about its other health effects. I mean, creatine probably has anti-tumor effects, plays a role in brain health and cognition. Creatine levels may be one of the triggers for depression in, in some people. It has so many different uh, applications in, in the body when we're talking about things outside of sports performance that creatine, again, is on my short list of supplements that I really do think that most people should be taking. I don't want to say regardless of age, because I'm cautious to give it to somebody once you breach 15 and lower, then I'm cautious, not that it would be harmful, but it would really be up to somebody's primary doctor to take something like that. But from 15 and above, no matter how old you are, I would say that most people should be supplementing with creatine. Now, I have a few follow-up questions for creatine. One of those is, when you think about the applications and the benefits beyond performance, do you think as you age, you would still benefit from having consistently creatine? Like, the more you age, probably the more benefit you might see from taking creatine on a daily basis, regardless of <laughs> whether you exercise or not? Probably. I mean, you have different immune cells in the body that can use creatine as, to help with energy metabolism when energy resources are, are low. And, and therein may lie some of the implications for its anti-tumor effects because things like cytotoxic uh, T cells may actually stop manufacturing their own creatine in the presence of inflammation, but they'll increase their transporter activity of creatine, suggesting that they rely on extracellular creatine, which, you know, in that case would be ingested from, from food or supplements. And in that way, they can continue immune surveillance, uh, you know, optimally. And so I think that even if, and especially if you're not exercising, then creatine might be beneficial for you at Uh, in older age, when we know things like immune function tend to decline or are compromised in one way or another, where heart health seems to suffer and cardiac cells can also use creatine and energy metabolism. In that case, is it recommended the same amount, five grams per day overall, or do you recommend that as a maintenance dose that is not necessarily performance related, should be lower than that or should be higher than that? I guess you can take body weight into consideration when it comes to this. Most people are going to need about two grams a day to maintain status of creatine as our body goes through about two grams a day. Any person on any given day is holding anywhere between 120 to 180 grams of creatine, whole body creatine, depending on their size. And I would imagine that some outliers who are much larger in size hold maybe 200 plus grams of creatine. I would say that two grams of creatine would probably be the minimum dose for most people when it comes to sports. Then we talk about raising the dose somewhere between three to five, possibly higher, at least for shorter periods of, of time. But I think in most cases, two grams is the base dose for efficacy. Okay. And when we think about creatine, are we talking about specifically monohydrate or any other form of creatine would do the same? Yes, yeah, so that's been pretty fleshed out for pretty nicely over the past couple of years is that most people know and understand that monohydrate has stood the test of time. It's the cheapest form and it's also it, no other form has shown 
uh, benefits that extend far beyond what monohydrate provides. I say the cheapest form, but <laughs> there's actually a worldwide shortage of, of creatine right now due to the supply chain issues the past two years. And so those of us in the industry supply or sell creatine or are feeling the pain there. And I've, I've seen the price of creatine monohydrate jump up quite a bit, but it used to be uh, pretty affordable and now it's becoming not so much, but, but monohydrate uh, is king when it comes to creatine. Looking at creatine again, I have heard a lot of people, especially with IBS <laughs> or generally bloating or inflammatory bowel disease, that when they take creatine, they seem to have like secondary effects of bloating, gas, or even diarrhea. Why is this and um, how you probably could overcome this if you have any experience? For some people, they do respond negatively to monohydrate. And as you said, that, that comes in the form of GI distress. And it happens it's more likely to happen in somebody who already has some underlying issue with that's going on in their gastrointestinal tract, but it can also happen in, in people who had no previous known issues. In that case, then you might think about taking a form like creatine hydrochloride, where the dose required is much smaller. It seems like it's more bioavailable and there's a lot less GI distress that's experienced with that form. The downside being that it tends to be a little bit more expensive than monohydrate. But if you're somebody that does not respond well in that respect to creatine, then hydrochloride is a great substitute. So you can still get the beneficial effects of creatine. How do you determine when someone is a good responder for creatine and when it's not? How do you determine that? <laughs> I would think that the best way to determine, there's a difference between a non-responder and somebody who's not responding well. And I would say if you're not responding well, then in most cases, you're looking at some kind of GI distress. But there doesn't really seem to be, there don't really seem to be a whole lot of instances in which negative responses to creatine extent and outside of the GI response. Whereas a non-responder would just be somebody who doesn't really seem to benefit any extra way by taking creatine. The best benchmarks to look at for that would probably be exercise performance or if you're getting tested in a clinical setting, then you might be able to assess like measures of depression because that's been done. But I would say that if you're just somebody taking creatine and you don't have other any underlying health issues or conditions and you want to know if you're a responder to creatine, the best place to, to find out would be in the gym. Okay. I think it is a little bit tricky because you would need to have every single potential factors taken into account because when you take it you don't really feel anything it's not like caffeine that you feel some effects straight away like you're more alert you're more hyped but when you're taking creatine you actually need to be taking it at least for a period of time at least like two weeks to actually start accumulating a decent amount in your muscles to see some potential effects in your actual performance but when we think about understanding whether it's you're responding to something or not uh, over the long term would be something specifically that you would be looking at, let's say a strength, a recovery, or like, are you able to measure it some way that you can actually pinpoint, yes, creatine is working, or is it very hard? I think like you said, there's, I mean, this is in real life, you know, how you control every variable in real life, unless you want to be a real stickler about every single thing that you, you do in a day, and you want to make sure you're getting the exact same amount of sleep every night, that your macros are the exact same every day, that, you know, all of your vitamins and minerals stay constant. It's never the most practical solution in the real world. And that's why usually a disconnect between like the exercise sciences and in the real world. I just driven um, up to Canton, Ohio today, which is three hours away from where I live to have a meeting about our next clinical study. We were talking about that. How many things, how many things should we really be sticklers about controlling for the subjects and how many things do we really need to let fly? Because sometimes the best way to test something is out in the real world where all of the variables aren't controlled because that's the most natural environment for you to be in and actually tested in. But to your point, you don't really feel the effects of creatine, at least not very strongly, right? Now, if you're somebody who's going to respond from the standpoint of depression, then okay, in that case, you might feel it. But when it comes to performance in the gym, you may see your strength going up at, at a rate that's faster than it was previously and think to yourself, ah, you know, I must be more rested or something, but you're not, you're not going to feel far different. It kind of falls into that bucket of supplements like uh, vitamin D, and magnesium where you don't necessarily feel them unless you have like an, an extreme deficiency then when you make up that deficiency then maybe maybe you'll feel something but in most cases you're not feeling them but that doesn't mean that they're not working and so creatine i say is on my short list of things that i think most people can and should take because it has so many different health implications not all of which you're going to feel it only affects your strength well creatine has personally and anecdotally it's never really done anything for my strength my strength doesn't it doesn't go up any faster when I'm taking creatine. It doesn't go down when I'm, I'm not taking creatine. So I've always thought that I was like a non-responder from a performance standpoint with creatine, but I still take it because of all the other aspects of health that it's implicated in. If at least a small effect on 
managing glu glucose with, in patients with diabetes. I think it is interesting to see more research in that area. Too. Research does keep extending outside of, of the area of sports with creatine. And that's why we've seen one of the reasons that we've seen it become so popular the past actually two years in the supplement industry. We've seen sales of creatine continue to go up, even as prices continue to go up. And I think that part of that is a consequence of all of this research that's coming out in different areas showing all, all of the different applications of creatine and all the different aspects of health that it actually does affect. And so I think because of that, more people or a much wider audience are being exposed to creatine and the consumer base has also increased because even in older people who aren't working out, they go, oh, I mean, well, this now matters for me. Is there a risk of, the, of deficiency for creatine? Obviously, there are groups that probably won't take meats or other natural sources of creatine. Perhaps when we think about vegetarians, vegans, are they the highest at risk group that we are talking about? Or are there other groups that can be at risk? To? Those would be the groups that are most likely to have lower levels of creatine. And the research on that has been a bit equivocal. You've seen some research showing that vegetarians and people and meat eaters don't have different levels of creatine. You have other research showing that creatine levels in the brain are different, and then also other research showing that they're not. But I think <clears throat> when you measure it all up next to each other, then people who are vegetarian and vegans do tend to have lower levels of creatine. And in some research, that does have negative impacts on different aspects of their health, notably in depression. And so creatine has been studied in that area a little bit, not in depth, but there's enough evidence to suggest that populations who I say were, are at risk for lower, having lower levels of whole body creatine are more likely to suffer from something like depression. Okay. Now let's move on to another one. I don't know if I pronounce it well. Ash, Ashwanda? Ashwagandha? <laughs> yeah, that one. So that one is overrated, underrated. <laughs> what is your verdict on this one? This one's interesting because it, it does sit inside, I, I would say, it's in my, my top five favorite botanicals. And I think it's a highly, highly valuable supplement. Now, I do think that people tend to use it for, I don't want to say inappropriate reasons as though it, it's a bad thing, but you, you see people using ashwagandha for using pre-workouts, which I, I've never, at least mechanistically, I, I don't understand why that's the case. And, I, and ashwagandha has a lot of research on its ability to reduce cortisol, reduce stress, and maybe even help prevent and reverse uh, burnout in, in people who work highly demanding jobs. And I know burnout is kind of a funky term, but it's actually been recognized by the World Health Organization as a real medical condition. From that standpoint, I think ashwagandha is highly valuable. I actually always keep some uh, on hand. I always keep it in my backpack and I take like my backpack everywhere with me. And that, that doesn't mean that I use it all the time. Maybe I keep it as a crutch, but I, I still have it in case I do need it because I burn out several times uh, over the year. Ashwagandha has a lot of research showing that it improves people's sleep. I already mentioned that it lowers cortisol stress. It raises people's subjective sense of well-being. And uh, there's also a lot of rodent data suggesting that uh, it can act as an antidepressant. And that, that data isn't so robust in people. But I, I do think that ashwagandha is not overrated. Just when it comes to sports nutrition, I don't always see it being applied in the right way. Do you think it is there is a specific dose that you will find beneficial? Should you be taking it consistently or do you see effects straight away? Or it's like creating the <coughs> to take it at least for a period of time until you actually see the benefits? Ashwagandha is one of those supplements that you do seem to ha have to take for a couple of weeks to actually see the benefits. I think most notably cortisol levels tend to track down over time with the shortest period being two weeks before that scene and that extending out about two months. As for long-term supplementation, there actually isn't any clinical data showing the safety of ashwagandha long-term. Does that mean it's not safe? No, not necessarily, but nobody knows, well, say the anti-cortisol effects sustain themselves over time, or is there does there come a point where there's a rebound effect, or does there come a point where uh, there are neurological consequences because the, the active ingredients, the withanalides and ashwagandha, you know, act on GABA receptors in the brain. And if those are, are stimulated for too long a period of time, once you remove a uh, substrate, you'll start to experience things like anxiety and depression. So nobody knows if those are consequences of long-term ashwagandha supplementation. But short-term, within a one to two-month time span, there don't really seem to be any negative side effects. Ashwagandha has been studied and it's been shown to be administered safely in conjunction with antidepressants like SSRIs, which you typically don't see with ingredients that do have effects in the brain. As for the dose, it really depends on 
the form that you're taking. I mean, there are commodity ingredients on the market, but there's also four primary patented ingredients, which tend to be the most popular. There's KSM 66, Sensoril, uh, Nuganda, and also Shodan, all of which have different levels of actives and different types of actives. And so they all have a different clinical dose recommendation for efficacy that's shown in the research that's been produced by the companies that supply those things. And you have like KSM 66, I believe is a, it's an extract that was pulled from the root. So it's a root only extract, whereas something like Sensoril is root and leaf. So they claim a more full spectrum uh, say you're getting maybe more of the active ingredients that are in the whole plant of ashwagandha, whereas the the people who own and sell KSM 66 make the claim that the root is where all the best things are found and it's applied in, in the most dense concentration. And, and nobody knows if that's true or not. So you have those companies butting their heads to claiming that mine is better. And so I like I like all of them. I've tried all of the major ones. I like them all. I tend to stick with uh, Sensoril and KSM 66. I've also had a lot of people tell me recently that they like Shodan ashwagandha, which is I think the the newest of the four on the market. The claim that you know it requires you require a lower dose to get the same effect as as something like KSM 66 because of higher bioavailability. And so that may or may not be true based off the available literature. I mean, I've seen some of like the internal data, and I'm not. I'm not convinced that's the case, but I've had people unprovoked tell me that they feel showed more. So maybe it is the case. When we think about how it is combined, do you think you should be taking it alone as a sole supplement? Or like when we see combined <laughs> other, other things, like I see, I have seen them in multivitamins that contain that this, this particular ingredient or like in no tropics or other supplements. So what is the best way to take it solely alone or <coughs> combined with both things? That really depends on, on what you want to get out of it. As much as I talk about supplements and I try to educate on supplements and I'm involved in supplements, I'm still a large advocate of taking as few things as possible and also taking the lowest dose possible to get the, the maximum effect. I mean, that really comes down to what you want to get out of ashwagandha. For me personally, I'm most likely to take it at night before sleep because I always tend to be kind of a high strung guy. If I can help keep cortisol lower than it should be overnight, hopefully I'm sleeping better. I don't track my sleep with an aura ring or anything like that. So I, I don't know if it's working uh, subjectively. I feel better when I take it. And so even if that's a placebo effect, then I'll take that all day. It's a pretty safe botanical. And so you can take it safely with most other ingredients that I would say people use as same nootropics like you just mentioned, but you can also take it on its own for like anti- stress affects it. It's not a flashy answer, but it just it just depends what you want to get out of its use. What's the minimum effective dose that you should be getting to <coughs> actually see some benefits? Well, KSM 66, I believe, is 500 milligram dose. Sensoril ashwagandha, I believe, is 125 milligram dose. I think Nuganda is 200 to 300 milligrams. I think 300 milligrams. And Shodan is a 70 milligram minimum dose, in case anybody is okay. interested in those. Okay. You mentioned something about cortisol, and I had a question for you. Obviously, there is a lot of correlation between elevated cortisol and weight gain. But how much does elevated cortisol actually impact weight gain? And are we talking about fat gain or mass gain in terms of like just body weight gain or other things happening? I think it can be both. I mean, depending on the circumstances, this is not as hard of a science as people make it out to be. If you have high levels of cortisol for an extended period of time, well, I mean, at some point those are going to drop off and you're not going to have enough cortisol. But if you're still in a stage where cortisol is elevated for a prolonged period of time, then you probably also have the systemic inflammation that's present. And I know that that's kind of like an ambiguous shadowy figure when it's mentioned like that. But in that case, body weight might go up a little bit more than likely due to like water, you know, say like water gain, that's what you want to call it, or water retention. But you could also put on some adipose tissue if you're in that state for an extended period of time. You know, that also depends on what you're eating and how, how much of it you're eating. Fortunately, I feel like the, these are debates that are going to rage on forever uh, over social media. But do hormones impact weight gain or is it the calories in, calories out? Which, to be honest, I feel like you have two camps of people and they both think they're talking about the same thing, but they're not. <laughs> and so they're like point, counterpoint, and like you guys aren't even arguing the same topic. It's not a fruitful conversation. That leaves people on the outside uh, confused and maybe even disheartened at times because they don't actually understand what's going on. Largely, we talk about weight gain and loss. What functions on is the law of thermodynamics, which implicates cellular bioenergetics. And then you have hormones like cortisol, which affects cellular bioenergetics. 
but nobody talks about it like that. Two different sides talking about different things and nobody seems to make any headway in the actual argument. Cortisol can make your body weight go up largely due to water retention, maybe a little bit of adipose accumulation, but that all just depends on how well you're sleeping and what you're eating and how much of it you are. I guess this question comes because obviously we know that cortisol is a mineral or corticosteroid. But at the same time, this steroid, this hormone is aligned with other hormones as well, depending on your state or <laughs> your being state. If you're stressed, if you're calm, anxious, depressed, it's for a short period of time or if it's like chronic. But also talking about cortisol, we also know that it's potentially a catabolic hormone that might utilize or target more your muscle mass, particularly to get energy from it when there is no enough substrate from other sources to act when your body is in stress. Probably do you think is it is because this body composition changes when cortisol is elevated is because nutrient partitioning, utilizing or increasing that catabolic rate from your muscle, so you're less likely to put on muscle or you're more likely to lose more muscle. <laughs> I would think that both are involved, but I also don't think anybody, again, like nobody knows the hard answer to that. You know, there's there's so many different things happening when you talk. We just talk about prolonged cortisol. Again, we, we're not asking about why why is cortisol elevated. And so like that might affect the answer as well. Is somebody more likely to be losing their muscle mass or are they just more likely to have less than optimal nutrient? partitioning. Probably both are happening when you're in like a, a prolonged state of elevated cortisol, but proportionally what's happening more is probably affected by what's causing elevated cortisol, at least chronically elevated cortisol. What do you think would be your verdict for caffeine? Is it overrated, underrated, properly rated? I think it's properly rated. The most used and abused psychostimulant on the planet. I think that caffeine is properly rated. Somebody had made uh, a comment to me. I don't know, it might have been as recent as last week. I put up some story about uh, caffeine and its health effects on, you know, blank. And somebody goes, ah, like this devil bean, I cut it out and I'll never go back to it. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Both the, the coffee bean and caffeine independently, but you know, also together, obviously, they have so many health benefits, but also there's so many downsides that come to the biggest downside being dependency. I mean, how, how many of us can, can function with a straight mind if we don't have a cup of coffee in the morning? I know that, I, you know, I'm, I'm not at the point in my life right now where I can, and my caffeine intake really isn't even that high. I do think that caffeine is probably the most efficacious over-the-counter supplements on the market in, in the world. It's such a double-edged sword. How much is this true? I've heard this statement very often that you shouldn't be taking any sort of, of form of caffeine when you wake up because it affects your cortisol. When your cortisol is as elevated in the morning, you shouldn't be taking caffeine at the same time in the morning. <laughs> you should be taking caffeine later on the day when your cortisol is lower. How much truth is in this? It's a little bit of a myth. I mean, if somebody is naive to caffeine, then it's more likely to spike their cortisol. Whereas if you have somebody who's habituated to caffeine, then taking in caffeine just makes it less likely that you're able to lower cortisol very well. It's not always causing a, you know, a massive spike in cortisol that you can't recover from. Now, there's, there are some interesting studies that have come out, I think one of which that came out last year. It wasn't animal research. This was a clinical where they gave people caffeine before they had breakfast and they found out that their glucose tolerance was far, far worse when they had caffeine before breakfast compared to when they had caffeine after breakfast. It was an experimental study. People, they want to do a follow-up on it to see like what the, the mechanism was. But I found that to be really interesting. If you're always drinking caffeine before you eat food in the day, is that going to result in like a body weight or body fat gain over time? I don't know. You'd have a clinically meaningful result there. But it is something I always think about now in the morning. If, I, if I'm drinking caffeine before I have breakfast, I'm like, is like my, my, are my blood glucose levels going to be the spike for the next like three or four hours? That's an interesting anecdote. When it comes to cortisol, yeah, you're more likely to get a cortisol spike if you're naive to caffeine. Where you won't be able to lower it as well if, if you're habituated to it. Okay. Now let's move on to rhodiola rosea. Is that another one that seems to be very popular, but is not very well known for quite a few people? Is this supplement overrated or underrated? I think that rhodiola is underrated. It has so much potential. And I, and I think the reason it's underrated is because there needs to be more clinical evidence, like with showing its effects in different areas. But it does have clinical data showing that it, it reduces fatigue, both in people who are non-exercisers and those, and also in people who are, are exercisers. I do think that there's a lot of different applications for rhodiola. It's been used in models of depression to show efficacy. It's even been shown to significantly extend longevity in animals. That probably isn't the case, at least to the degree it does in animals and humans. It hasn't been tested in humans, but that is a really interesting bit of research that's been done on it. It has been shown to protect the brain from environmental toxins. Again, I, I mentioned ashwagandha is in like, it's in my, my top five favorite botanicals. I would say that rhodiola sits in there as well. It's one of my favorite supplements that, that I would consider a, a nootropic. 
Okay. Do you think you should, to see benefits, you should be using it on a regular basis? Is it like as a wonder that you have to use it for a period of time? This has more like direct effect once you take it. So it does have acute effects when it comes to mood and, and boosting mood and even exercise tolerance but it has other effects where it too actually lowers cortisol levels and specifically animal data has shown that it lowers cortisol levels in the brain, not, not beyond what they should be, but lowering elevated cortisol levels in response to a stress test. And so there are acute effects of rhodiola, but when you look at say the effects of lowering cortisol, then that similar to ashwagandha is when it's taken over a period of time, preferentially a couple of weeks. Now let's move to Johimbi. Is this one overrated, underrated? What's your verdict to this one? Uh, this one I feel is overrated. It does work. I, I feel like when you look at uh, statistical significance versus clinical meaningfulness, there's a bit of a, a gap. You know, most people take it for its effects on body composition. Specifically, it stimulates, you know, lipolysis. And so people use it as, as a fat burner. And so in that regard, I think it's overrated. Now, when it comes to, to looking at its ability to stimulate, you know, let's say uplift, it also it's, it's been studied in showing people who take it have a better subjective well-being so you would call it a mood a mood boosting ingredient and it is a bit of a stimulant because of the mechanism that it acts on so when it comes to its ability to increase energy <laughs> then i would say it's not overrated but it's not underrated it, it kind of sits where it should be but when you look at its effects on fat loss then i would say overrated do you think for those who are <laughs> potentially caffeine intolerant or they wouldn't be able to tolerate it very much because they have secondary effects like migraines or they feeling lightheaded because of the caffeine or hypertension or whatever. Johimbin could be a good substitute that will have some effects in <coughs> stimulating you a little bit, but not so much caffeine does. I guess that really just depends on the dose. You know, like if somebody had was having those kind of responses with caffeine and like, you know, my first response would be, well, if you taper the dose back, you know, and then if you're still getting those effects, even at low doses, then maybe you can switch over and try another stimulant like, like Johimbin. And so in that regard, you know, it also, the dose is really important for Yohimbine. When, when we, uh, in the industry, if you sell something with Yohimbine in it, the FDA requires you to have a much longer warning section on the label. And you have to include all these things about people on blood pressure medication. I think that the reason being is just because people are more likely to take more Yohimbine than is necessary to get an effect than they are to caffeine. That people are, tend to be pretty familiar with caffeine and its doses, whereas Yohimbine you know, an efficacious dose could be one milligram depending on, on your body weight. But I think it, it really okay. just depends how do you respond to caffeine, even at low doses, because somebody could have those negative side effects you listed. Somebody could have those at one milligram of Yohimbine. Everybody's so, so different when it comes to stimulant response. Okay. There's another one that is very <laughs> popular nowadays. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So that is Torkesteron. Is that one <laughs> overrated, underrated? Maybe we don't have enough data. What are your thoughts <laughs> So I guess this depends who, who you're talking to. And I'm not going to trash it because I do think that the available data is promising. There's no clinical data, you know, in, in, in humans. And so that is the biggest limitation to this. It falls inside of a class of, of compounds called ectosteroids, which are found in both insects and plants. And there have been other ectosteroids, you know, like beta ectosterone that have been tested in people with actual clinical studies that have been done recently too, showing some pretty profound effects. And so profound that WADA banned the ingredient, the, you know, a day after the study was published. A study like that also has not been reproduced. Chemically speaking, from a chemistry standpoint, turcosterone should be dose per dose stronger than some of its analogs like ectosterone, which, which would be found in, in spinach. I would say that it, it, the animal data and the cell data are promising just because of the effects on protein synthesis it does show. And then also the, the length by which it shows that. It seems to extend protein synthesis to a degree that's far greater than other active compounds that you would find in different botanicals that you would think would do that. But the biggest limitation is lack of data in humans. And also the proposed mechanism doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But <clears throat> again, it's, it's not because it's not a thing. It's just because the appropriate research hasn't gone into it to, to really flesh it out more. So I would say that it's a, it's a promising ingredient. But as of right now, like, I couldn't recommend it to somebody as something that works. Okay. With L-carnitine, is that a, a supplement that's overrated or properly rated or underrated? Similar to Yohimbine, I think that overrated when it comes to taking it for fat loss. That seems to be generally why people take L-carnitine, especially when you, you look at the fitness industry. But L-carnitine 
itself plays such an important role. General cell health and specifically mitochondrial health by helping sh basically shuttling junk outside of mitochondria and also assisting in energy metabolism. Their metabolism gets altered in, in one way or another, either you know going up or down, hypo, hypo or hyper, then that could spell all kinds of trouble, at least when you're talking about like a, a single cell. L-carnitine, I think, is underrated when you look at it outside of the fat loss, but inside of fat loss, overrated. Okay. What about collagen? Is that overrated or underrated? I say underrated. Uh, that's not the most popular take. You know, I, the amount of times I've heard, or like I like could scroll through Instagram and I see people like trashing certain supplements or ingredients and the only thing i can think of I'm just like you must not be very familiar with the actual data it just sounds like you're repeating something that you heard somewhere maybe something that's convincing but not necessarily true uh, hydrolyzed collagen specifically is underrated now not for somebody like me i don't really need to take collagen because i think that i'm getting an adequate amount of the substrate in the form of like arginine, glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, like all the amino acids that make up a bulk of collagen protein. I, I get an adequate amount of those every day. And that, when it comes to collagen synthesis and the skin health and all that, then when we talk about collagen, the most important thing is that you're getting an adequate amount of the substrate needed for collagen synthesis and also the cofactors like you know, vitamin C and magnesium used in like making collagen. That's number one most important. Collagen itself, obviously it helps supply that substrate in the appropriate ratios. But you also have hydrolyzed collagen. It's technically, it's not a whole protein. The hydrolysis process turns basically particles into peptides, which are strings of amino acids, and they can get absorbed whole as they are without getting broken down further. Peptides have actually been shown to basically act as ligands for fibroblasts. So like that lock and key mechanism, you can have a, a collagen peptide actually uh, attached to a fibroblast and trigger it to stimulate collagen synthesis. And the same, it does the same thing with chondrocytes, which stimulates cartilage synthesis in, in the joints. And so that can be another mechanism through which actually taking collagen could be useful. And then thirdly, it does look like <coughs> supplemental collagen triggers an immune response where you have a class shift of M1 macrophages to M2 macrophages. And that's a type of immune cell, whereas M1 tends to be more pro-inflammatory. M2 seems to be more anti-inflammatory as it uh, signals for the clearance of debris and also cellular remodeling. Now, I think that the, the first benefit of collagen, just getting into substrate again, like that's the most important thing for collagen synthesis. But, and, and somebody like, uh, say, my age, who's relatively young and healthy, I, I don't need to take supplemental collagen, but the population that's most likely to benefit from that are people who are, say, 40 plus years old, and especially so when you get to the 60 plus range. Or someone who is quite active in the gym and they are more exposed to wear and tear of the joints. <laughs> It could also help in that regard. I mean, there's several studies that, that show collagen's benefit on, in joint health for athletes. There are not a whole lot of recent studies, but there are studies that date back to the 1970s that I think were actually performed in Russia. You can't even get the English version of the manuscripts. And they were using straight uh, bovine gel. This is before collagen was hydrolyzed to make it more palatable. I've seen it in supplements, at least in, in the legion supplements, I've I've seen they have like collagen type 2 and collagen type 1. Is there a specific effect for this being type 1 or type 2 on <laughs> joint health? Yeah, so there's like, I think it's 28 different types of collagen. 80% of skin collagen is made up of type 1 collagen. 15% of skin collagen is made up of type 3 collagen. And then 5% is filled in by a couple other different types. 90% of bone collagen is made up of type 1 collagen. And 80% of joint collagen is made up of type 2. And joint collagen, like cartilage, type 2, skin and bone are largely types 1 and 3. And you see on a supplement bottle, usually the, the most common form of collagen or the most common source is bovine or cowhide. That's type 1 and 3. And you also see porcine, which is the pig, basically. And that's also type 1 and 3 because they're using the hide. And then type 2 typically comes from chicken sternal cartilage. That's where we source it, at least commercially. All right, I am conscious of your time and I think I'm going a little bit over. So I'm going to have two more supplements and I let you go. Is that all right? That's fine, yeah. Let's go and peak inositol. Is this one overrated or underrated? I would say overrated for its use, as you had asked me, say the fitness industry. I would say overrated. Most of the benefits of inositol are seen at doses far higher than they're given in sport, <laughs> sports and nutrition supplements. And typically the, the largest benefits come you know, in like women with PCOS and, and things like that. But the, the, the doses of inositol for at least efficacious doses, you're usually looking at 10 plus grams 
of inositol. So I would say overrated for its inclusion in sports nutrition supplements, but you know, not, not overrated when it's being used appropriately. You just don't always see it like that because you can't, you can't really always give an efficacious dose of something like inositol and then also add it, you know, in conjunction with, with other ingredients because an efficacious dose of inositol in most cases is taking like eight to 10 plus pills. I've seen it generally recommended for women with PCOS uh, on, a, on a dose between two and five grams a day. Is that is too it, on the dose or <clears throat> should be higher? Yeah, it's usually between like 10 and 20, like typically 16 grams and higher for women with PCOS. Now, you, maybe you'll get some effect with two to five, but like when it's being treated in a clinical setting, then you're using doses well above 10 grams. Okay, let's talk about omega-3 fatty acids in the fitness industry. Is this what overrated or underrated? Interesting. I've seen the weirdest thing happen like the past two years with omega-3s. I've seen them getting so maligned on social media. Like some people with like these weird cult followings and they talk about how bad omega-3s are for you. I don't know if you've seen this, but it actually like makes my blood boil. So I have to like, I have to like sit back and like take deep breaths and just like not engage. I think that uh, within the fitness industry, I would say that omega three is maybe overrated for why people think that they're taking them because I don't really think people understand why they take omega threes. But when you talk about general health, I would say that they're probably underrated in that not enough people actually understand the importance of them and why they should be taking them for different af- aspects of health. Most notably, actually being able to to trigger, produce, and, and modulate a healthy inflammatory response is uh, omega threes are you know implicated in in the manufacturing of pro-resolving mediators, you know, outside of the roles they play in like structural stability of a lot of different cellular membranes. I think that in some cases, omega-3s can be overrated just because people don't, they might be applying them for the wrong reasons, but I think overall underrated because not enough people are taking good sources of omega-3s and not for the right reasons. But uh, omega-3s, just like uh, magnesium and creatine, those, those sit on my short list of supplements that I do think that most people should be taking a quality source of. If we were to say, what are your top three supplements with greatest effects on performance? Well, I guess, gosh, I mean, are we just going to say generally or are we going to, because it, it might change if we're going to be specific for like endurance performance or strength performance or. We can, we can categorize them if you want to. Strength performance, we go caffeine, creatine. Those are the two most obvious ones. So, because if we were just talking about general performance, I would say caffeine, creatine. And then uh, for me, it, it would be a toss up between you know, beta alanine and dietary nitrates, you know, and then you could always, if you were talking about endurance performance, then you could throw in sodium bicarbonate as like a, and, and make the argument for that one. Generally speaking, if you just look at the breadth of literature on things that you can rely on, then you have caffeine, creatine, beta alanine, and then, you know, the dietary nitrates and then sodium bicarb kind of, they, they ride the bench, but, but they could step in as, as starters depending on, you know, what aspect of performance we were talking about. What about your top three for body composition. That's interesting because most things do not affect body composition like people think they do. In that case, I would say protein, preferentially from an animal source, but if we're talking about supplements, then, then probably whey or an egg protein. And then, I mean, that that right there is probably, that's the biggest one. Again, creatine, it's so boring because it's so good at most things, but I would say protein, creatine. Just, I had another one in mind. This is kind of a, this might not be one that I would be able to, I wouldn't be able to say this and publish it in like a peer-reviewed paper, but I think that I would add in something like a rhodiola or ashwagandha that actually did help control stress and, and cortisol. And in that regard, then you can make a, you can make an argument that indirectly it's affecting body composition because maybe, you know, if stress is lower then maybe general inflammation is a little bit lower. Also, maybe you're sleeping a little bit better and that's more likely to affect your body composition than a supplement is. So uh, I would probably throw in a, a botanical like that as a bit of a wild card. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I've heard a few people talking about uh, betaine. I think that one's I think I think that one's overrated, at least for for its effects on body composition. When you look at all the data, it, a lot of it comes from the same lab. Data outside of that lab hasn't been able to be reproduced, and so now betaine it, it can be highly useful for actually you know say general health purposes because it's a methyl donor, and so you need adequate methylation, which some people aren't aren't getting enough of, especially if you know certain gene mutations or if they have poor diet and stuff like that. So I think for for general health, uh, betaine can be pretty useful. But when it comes to body composition, uh, overrated. My last question on that one would be your top three for health and longevity. Top three for health. I have a couple for this one. So this one's probably the hardest one because I got I to choose between some of my favorites. So I would say omega-3s, 
magnesium, a close one between vitamin D and creatine. I might have to give okay. the nod. I might have to give the nod to vitamin D, but creatine would be close fourth. Why vitamin D? Why do you think vitamin D is so essential? <laughs> it's implicated in so many more reactions than people realize, and even I think that you know people researching it understand. I mean, it's been considered as the forgotten neurosteroid among its its many many roles. It has a role in immune cell activity and health. In brain function, in gut function, in bone health, in muscle health, there's almost nothing that you can't implicate it in, at least indirectly. And most people really are deficient. You know, I, I, that's not that's not a cliche. I was living in Florida last year, and for the past six years before that, I was in Florida, and now I'm in Ohio. And I had just gotten my blood work done a couple months ago. Vitamin D is one of the things I do take every day. I thought that I was taking enough. Like when I was in Florida, I was taking the same amount. My blood work always came back really good. My vitamin panels always looked fine. I know, you know we could argue the, the limitations of some vitamin panels, but you know it's it's practical for most people. And you know here I got my blood work done, and my vitamin D was just sitting outside adequacy range. Like I, I was, I wasn't deficient, but I was in inadequacy. And I was like, wow, holy crap! I thought I actually I thought that I was taking enough, and I guess I really wasn't. So I had to up my dose. But also my zinc was a little low, and zinc helps vitamin D get into a cell. So I had to kind of resolve those two things. But vitamin D, omegas, magnesium. I, I have to throw creatine in there, even though you only asked me for three. So just just a quick question about vi uh, vitamin D. If you are not deficient, and you probably, because <coughs> I know, like, rarely people go and have a blood work done just to check if their vitamin Ds are low or high. They just think there is a good supplement, and they should be taking it, and they take it without noticing whether they are deficient or not. Is it safe to supplement with vitamin D even if you're not deficient? Yeah, even if you're not deficient, so vitamin D supplementation is pretty safe. I know, like, you, you will hear some people talk about vitamin D toxicity, but that's really a lot more difficult to, it's really a lot more difficult to achieve vitamin toxicity than, than most people understand. So you can be with inadequacy and still be taking vitamin D, so within reasonable ranges and still be pretty safe. Now, yeah, most people aren't going to want to take over 10, like 10,000 plus IUs for long, long periods of time if they don't really have a reason to be supplementing in the first place. Although most people can supplement safely, like supplementing is fine because it's, it's practical. You can see people taking 10,000 plus IUs and still not actually reaching adequacy status because supplementation, it only goes so far. Like it doesn't, vitamin D is a, a complicated one. And it's actually, it's actually had a text roll across my screen. I can't read the whole thing because we're on this live, but it's my friend Matt in Canada. And he's, he's a bit of a, I, I would call him a very, I would call him an expert. I would call him an expert in the, the world of, of vitamin D. And he said something about vitamin D out there. I don't know what it was, but is talking about all the different factors that vitamin D is dependent on. He's right. Like you can't just, you can't supplement away a deficiency in all cases. Okay. So in any case, you should be able to get away from having vitamin D supplements, regardless whether you are at risk or not. And what would you say are the people who are at higher risk of vitamin D deficiency, apart from the elderly that might not go outside that much or those who live in places that have no much of sunlight, which other group of people might be at risk as well? Well, you have people who aren't taking enough, say, dietary cholesterol could be at risk as good cholesterol is the precursor substrate for endogenous vitamin D synthesis. And so if you have somebody who's, let's say, fearful of eating eggs because of the cholesterol risks that they pose, which, you know, I think mo most of us know that if everything else isn't, the rest of your diet is in order. I mean, of course you can get in, you can raise cholesterol levels higher than you would like to if you're, t if you're eating like a dozen eggs a day and you also have extremely high carbohydrate and high fat diet, then yeah, then eating 12 eggs a day probably isn't the best thing in the world, but uh, actually adding dietary cholesterol is pretty beneficial when it comes to, let's say the manufacturing of things like vitamin D, even K2, and also things like CoQ10. Well, I think I've taken so much of your time and I am so, so grateful that you came in. We have been able to clarify a lot of these questions on supplements. Is there any place or any future project you're looking forward to or you, you're likely to be working on in the future? Yeah, actually a lot. Some of them I can't disclose, others I can. So our lab is, as I said, up and running. We finished our first clinical about last month. So we'll publish the paper on that one soon. And then we're also getting ready to start another clinical and we're, we're actually kind of like backed up and then the studies that we have lined up. But outside of that, then our, uh, our nonprofit, which the research facility actually falls under, will be producing uh, a lot of educational content, which I'll help headline 
And uh, most people don't see my face very often on these types of things. I'll have to be a little bit more vocal as it comes to those things. And that'll be fun once we start producing our educational content. And if anybody watching this happens to be at the Arnold in Columbus next week, then I'll be speaking at the educational event on Saturday at 4 p.m., I believe. So you know, feel free to stop in and say hello. That's awesome. Well, William, it was a pleasure to talk to you and bring you on. Where can people find you? Is there any specific place that you want them to look for you? Right now, uh, Instagram is what I frequent. And then, you know, I have been using Twitter a little bit more frequently. My handle over there is different than my Instagram handle, which probably isn't isn't the best for people finding me. But so it's Dr. William Wallace here and then uh, Will the Wallace on Twitter because you, Dr. William Wallace is too long for Twitter, I guess. So uh, those, are, those are the two platforms where I hang out the most. Well, it was a pleasure to see you and I hope to see you very soon. You have a great day. All right. Thanks for having me, Astrid. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care.